In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The third type of confidence is confidence in answers to spiritual requests. In John 11, Jesus was with Lazarus. Here, Jesus said something great. He said, I thank you, O Father, because you heard me. He said this before Lazarus emerged from the tomb. What is this thanks in regards to, since the miracle didn't happen yet? Jesus went on to say, I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. Now, Lazarus, come out. In regards to when he says, I know that you always hear me, it illustrates that Jesus is holy and perfect, but also as a person he taught us how to pray. So here he shows us confidence that any spiritual request will be answered. Jesus said, when you ask for heaven, you will receive it. Ask for repentance, you will receive it. Ask for wisdom, you will receive it. Ask for purity of heart, you will receive it. Ask for salvation for people, you will receive it. Because the request is in accordance with my will. Ask for money, it will lead you astray. Ask for health, it doesn't have a purpose. Ask for revenge, you will be lost. When it comes to spiritual requests, our Lord smiles. He does not always give things to us in the time we want. No, maybe he will delay. However, trust that any request he asked of us and you return back to him will certainly be answered. Answered after a year or a hundred years, is still, it, it is still answered. So you must be very happy. Can you believe that your request is answered? What if all your prayers and requests were spiritual? When you come out of prayer, you will be relaxed because you can be confident that all you prayed about will be answered. When you ask about something earthly, you don't know exactly if it will be answered or not. However, when it comes to anything heavenly, you can be sure that it will be answered. Have confidence that the Lord will not only answer all spiritual requests, but is also happy that you asked for it. This word all is here because there are people who get confused. Here the all refers to the prayers that he is sure his children will ask for. We are his children, so we are supposed to understand him. All that, all that you ask for in prayer, be assured that you will receive it. Go to him and say, help me to love people more. Of course, my beloved. Then you get into a fight an hour later. Lord, I just prayed that you would open my heart. Okay, I will give it to you. Pray again, and a third time. I will allow you to be able to love people from all your heart, because this is a request that is pleasing to me. You say to him, Lord, teach me how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Okay, my beloved, I will teach you. You get distracted while praying, and you get annoyed with yourself. I get distracted, and I keep asking you to teach me how to pray. I will give this to you. You will pray, and you will pray from, from your heart. Th this day will come. Don't fear. You asked for something that I have asked from you. Why would I not give it to you? In Isaiah chapter 7, there was a strange situation. Jesus sent Isaiah to someone named Ahaz. He was a king, but he wasn't good. The Lord kept pleading with him to change his mind before he was led astray. The Lord said, Ask the Lord your God for a sign. This is as if someone comes to you and says, See what you want, and the Lord will do it for you. What you want, take. Bring your deepest request, meaning don't request using empty words. Ask for something that, that has weight. The Lord has given you an opportunity. Ask for what you want. Lift it up, meaning if you want to receive from heaven, you will receive. If you want to receive from below the earth, you will receive. To show that he loves you. Ahaz said to him, no, 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 I won't ask. Why not ask? Because he doesn't have anything spiritual in mind and he doesn't have a relationship with God. He's not God's son and he doesn't understand how God deals with him. He said, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. Do you know what test the Lord means? It means that I am not convinced and that I think that if I ask, then he won't hear me. Because, because of this, the Lord was upset. He says, I'm telling you to ask for what you want so I can show, that, show you that I love you. You tell me you won't ask because I don't want to try you. You don't want to try me. Is the problem with is the problem now with me? So Isaiah said to him, "Listen, house of David, because they were David's descendants, is it not enough to try patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also?" 
meaning you have frustrated the people. Do you want to frustrate me also? I don't get frustrated, but I do feel for you. I will give you the request that you can't dream to ask for, so I can show you that there is no request that is too difficult for me. A virgin became pregnant and gave birth. I will come from heaven for people like you. The requests that you are hesitant to share, like saying, Lord, can you forgive me? God says, forgive you. I will come to you. I will come to your world. If you are scared to ask, it's not because we're humble. No, we're scared to ask because we don't have confidence in God's love and we don't have spiritual requests to motivate us. However, the saints have spiritual requests that propel them all the time. They say, Lord, you must, you must clean my heart before I leave. Don't leave my heart like this. Find a solution. I want you to put in me peace that, that will help my stubborn mind. There are two that appeared with Jesus at the Transfiguration. Who were they? Elijah and the Moses. And Moses. Why those two? Of course, there are many who are beloved by our Lord. These two specifically are professionals at prayer. Their lives are prayer. Elijah and Moses, the prophet, were not the greatest people to live. The two of them are full of faults. Jacob says, Elijah was a person who suffered from pain just like us. The meaning of pain here is sin. Suffered from pain is something that happens to a normal person. Elijah was someone who made mistakes, got upset, and there came a time where he made a huge mistake. He prayed that it would not rain, so it did not rain for three years and six months. He then prayed again, and it rained, and the earth brought forth fruits. Jacob summarized it for us in two verses. Let's see these two verses, what happened with Elijah. When Elijah prayed for the heavens to close, they closed, and when he prayed for them to open, they opened. The first event is mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 17. Now, Eli now Elijah the Tishbite from, from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next years except at my word. It does not mention here that he prayed at all, except Jacob clarified and said he prayed. He prayed, so the Lord heard him. It appears that he rushed and said, there will not be a drop of water unless I say so. So did he agree with God? Did he get permission? Did he pray? Did he have a month of fasting and prayer to close the heavens? No, Elijah just said it. So the Lord would have said to him, Okay, my son, we will close the heavens. He did not pray at all, but Jacob considered it as prayer. When God opened the heavens, the situation switched. Three and a half years passed. You know, in these three and a half years, a raven would come and bring meat. And there, would, and there was the story with the widow and the boy who died and was raised from the dead. All these stories were in these three and a half years. The three and a half years then finished. Afterwards, Elijah met with Ahab again. The first meeting was before the three and a half years and the second was following them. So Ahab became frustrated and said to Elijah, You made us hungry and killed us. Afterwards, there was the meeting of the prophets of Baal. They offered a sacrifice and a, fire of the, and a fire of the Lord fell and burned it up. The people were stunned and proclaimed, The Lord is God. Elijah was used to his word being final, so he said to Ahab, Leave, there is the sound of rain. Again, here he didn't pray. He thought that the way things go is that he just speaks and that's it. Of course, the Lord won't embarrass him. Just a few days before fire came down, he just had to say, Lord, answer me. And as soon as he said that, the fire came down. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. He said, I hear the sound of rain. Really? Three and a half years of no rain, and now you hear it? Ahab was accustomed to listening to Elijah. He had said the heavens will close, and they did. Then Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. He figured when he was on the mountain that the rain will fall. The last time, without praying, the heavens closed. He goes up a step or two or ten, there's no rain. Elijah spoke to his servant and told him to tell Ahab to leave or he will drown. Elijah figured it was time to pray. He was used to God doing what he wanted without praying. He wanted to say, don't embarrass me. I told the man to leave, it will rain. 
We agreed about three and a half years, which have now passed. He bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees, meaning he did a montaña, a prostration. He did not do this a lot. He's used to things happening the first time without praying. He then raised his head and envisioned pouring rain and plants emerging. He said to his servant, go and look towards the sea, meaning look at the sea, maybe the rain is coming from there. So he went and looked. There is nothing there, he said. He did not understand the scenario that was happening between Elijah and our Lord. So Elijah said, return seven times. And what should he do seven times? Put his head down and pray to the Lord for rain. On the seventh time, the servant reported, A cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So, so Elijah said, Go and tell Ahab, Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, and heavy rain started falling. This story has a very deep meaning. The rain didn't fall. Even after Elijah said it would, or he prayed, or bowed, or did a matanya, despite all this, he didn't doubt for a moment. It will fall. It means it will fall. This is the confidence. The confidence in prayer. All the people were saying that the weather was beautiful, and it was just like the past three and a half years. There wasn't a drop of rain. So what difference would that day make? However, Elijah knew. No, I'm sure he will hear me. I will not doubt he will hear me means he will hear me because it is his will because I agreed with him. Do you all understand this idea? So I will not doubt with this same confidence. Elijah said to his servant, go tell Ahab again to leave before he drowns. With this confidence, the heavens suddenly darkened and from everywhere it was as if the heavens were clapping for Elijah because of his confidence and prayer. And it rained very hard. Elijah's greatness is that while he was suffering from pain as we are, he was very sure in prayer. Even if the Lord delayed and didn't respond to him and everything else was telling him no, he was not shaken. He knew God would answer his prayer. This is the greatness of these saints. It's not that they don't make mistakes. They do. It's this level of prayer that raises a person. The last story is of Moses. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. The Amalekites were notorious to the Israelites. You know how they would scare the children and tell them stories about demons and other bad things? This is what the Amalekites were to the Israelites, who knew of them from their time in Egypt. They would say, they are very tall people that eat people, and would scare themselves. They heard that they were coming and were all overcome with fear because they didn't have any weapons to defend themselves and couldn't go to war against anyone. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalek Amalekites. Joshua said yes, figuring they would all become martyrs. Moses then said he would, he would stand on top of the hill to make sure they would win. He would go up and pray and speak. Perhaps Joshua wondered, So where will we fight from? How will we distribute the swords, etc.? However, Moses would say to forget all this and not speak about these details. He decided to go to the top of the hill, since that is how success is achieved. From Moses' perspective, whatever was done down there, however they fought, they are below. He wanted to go up the hill. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As soon as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up. See the generosity of the saints. One on each side. This is something very strange, that someone carries someone else's arm, arms up. So that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with the sword. There were times where his arm would fall down, and when it fell, the Amalekites won. The most important thing was that they support his arms. All this so that it may be clear to us the idea of confidence in prayer. Rest assured, if the answer is delayed, continue on. The church does not ask for anything aside from this. The war that is going on below doesn't matter. 
Things happening in politics doesn't matter. Who's with us and who's against us, that's all small talk. Everything for us is above. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a remembrance. When the Lord liked to impart a lesson, he would say, Moses, wait, so no one forgets, write this down. Write this down for the future generations. What should I write, Lord? Write this depiction. Write this scene. This lesson is very important for all the generations, which is to rely on prayer. This is the lesson I want you to learn. Returning to the verse, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. The Amalekites people liked, likened to demons. He said, as long as your arm is raised, I will destroy them. So Moses made an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. This means the Lord is my victory. He said, because his hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. I understood this verse in this way. When you raise your arm up to the Lord when you pray, You have placed your hand on the Lord's throne. You are saying to him, I am not leaving you until you get involved. Imagine this lowly hand can touch the Lord's throne. When I prayed, my hand touched God's throne. Therefore, I took all the heavenly power to be ours. All the angels work for us. Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war. It is not our fight. To God be the glory and honor forever. Amen.